Cruz, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry, who may need to check some message on his phone. No, I'm good. Okay. It, it did go off, but it's, it's not that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this time. <laughs> this time? Yeah. So it wasn't prompting you to change out some player in your fantasy football <laughs> league? Nope. Or <laughs> that, that was not what that message was okay. about. I mean, I thought it might be something really important like that. So, yeah, yeah. You know. it, that would be really important if that were the case, <laughs> yeah. just so you know. <laughs> don't you have till Sunday or at least till tomorrow? I don't know. They moved a bunch of games around. There. I haven't looked at what they did. Okay. Apparently, the COVIDs has attacked the NFL. Is it Omicron? I, you know, they haven't said specifically what strain has attacked mm-hmm. the NFL. Just that it is attacking the NFL. Those poor bastards. Yep. I don't know how they're going to survive. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) young fit men. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Right. You know, they're the ones dropping like flies. Yeah. Well, they are. (laughs) Oh, are they? Yeah. Yeah. Man, Uh, professional athletes all over the place are dropping on the field um, due to blood clots and stuff if they've been vaccinated. Wow. Yeah. And it's funny. Like, it's just a coincidence. It's, it's crazy, man. Like, so the, the, with the NFL, like, so, if if a player gets COVID, he has so many days. Like if he, if there's different protocols for if he's vaccinated and unvaccinated. Which you would think, like if if the vaccine did what it was supposed to do, I'd be like, okay, I get down with that. Because if 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 the vaccine actually prevented you from spreading it, then it mm-hmm. would be like, okay, well, you know, if he's vaccinated, he should be able to go back with the team. You mm-hmm. know, blah blah blah. That's not the case. There's um, I think it's like. I forget how many days they have to be out regardless if whether they're healthy or not. If they're not vaccinated, they have to mix X amount of time, Mm -hmm. period, if they're not vaccinated. But then if they are vaccinated, then they just have to be no fever and like two positive or two negative tests Mm -hmm. and they can go back immediately. Yeah. And it's like. It, but it makes no sense because whether they're vaccinated or not has nothing to do with how they transmit the virus mm-hmm. once they have it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, voluntarism these days means that uh, we make your life increasingly difficult until you voluntarily do what you we want you to do. Well, and in this case, there's immense pressure from the owners of the team and, mm-hmm. and the people on the team, because if you're not vaccinated and you get sick, you're definitely going to miss i think it's like a week or whatever yeah regardless of whether you're good to go or not and so you're hurting your team by not being vaccinated Uh you know um which sucks like yeah i mean because these guys like really care about what they're doing you know they want to i mean a lot of these are like playoff teams you know yeah you know is it that time yeah, they're, they're not there yet. They're they're go, um, getting ready. So uh, fantasy is in their playoffs now, mm. but the um, NFL they're like vying, and it's a competitive year. Like it looks like there's going to be there's, there's some fights to be had to get into the playoffs. Yeah. So I used to follow all that stuff. I, I followed it more this year than I ever have in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just uh, you know once I. Um... Once I stopped cable TV, that was kind of the end of sports for so me. So we don't I have just, cable at the house either. I didn't so it's, care enough to take one of the other routes to yeah to keep up. Yeah, I mean we've got we we get football games and stuff at the house, but no, we don't have cable, so it's a lot more difficult when you don't have cable to yeah. watch football. I, oh, I actually did get one of the little air things that you can plug into a, a modern TV. Oh um, yeah, to pick up uh, over the air channels. Yeah. Um, but I, I it's it's still sitting in the box behind my. You TV. never I even like, bothered. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. I was like, I'm going to watch the Saints games, and then I just. Oh yeah. It's saying. funny playing fantasy football. So I've always kind of just rooted. I've always, when I've watched the game, so I'm a Saints fan. So I've mm-hmm. always pulled for the Saints when they're on. But mm-hmm. if it's just a random football game, I just kind of get a feel for the players and then kind of root for the players that play for Alabama or something mm-hmm. like that, or SEC players yeah. or former SEC players. And um, so it's the same way with fantasy now. Like I don't even care anything about the game. All I care about <laughs> is what players are performing how, whether yeah. they're on my team or not and how they're doing. Yeah. So watching, watching, NFL with me is crazy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I used so. to do uh, fantasy basketball. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of the same thing. Although this was in the um, at a time when every year that I played fantasy basketball, I went out of my way to make sure that my first pickup every year um, was Tim Duncan. Oh, yeah. Yep. Because Tim Duncan was good for 20 and 10 every single game. Every game. Nice. <laughs> every single game. Oh, uh, well. Yeah. Um, I'm, 
I don't even know what happened. Yeah. Well, anybody that's playing fantasy football this year knows, like, Cooper Cup, who I have on my team, mm-hmm. has outperformed every expectation you could have asked for. Yeah. <laughs> so, but nobody saw it coming. I picked him up just as a – I thought he was a good player and he'd do well, and he has absolutely put up the best points mm-hmm. that you could ask for consistently all season. Yeah. It's been amazing. At this point, I'd be hard-pressed to name professional athletes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's – <laughs> Let's dive on After in. that long intro, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> if anybody's still listening, not just waiting for uh, fantasy football tips. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, but, I got some. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you who the sleepers are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody would have trusted you with that before this year. No, but now they <laughs> all would want to know. Anybody in our league would be like, oh, you got sleepers? <laughs> um, so there have been uh, a couple of high profile trials of some ladies that have been going on. Um, they, I say high profile, even though there's been essentially no media coverage of either one of them. Yeah. Well, the, the one you told me about the other day, I didn't even know that was going on. Yeah. And then the other one I've been paying some, a little bit of attention to. Yeah. But. I mean, I don't have a whole lot to say about either of these cause there's just not a lot of information, uh, frankly. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can talk uh, about them, but just, just know that it's going to be kind of superficial. Yeah. Um, the, the one that, uh, that you'd been following was, uh, Jalen Maxwell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is the, uh, um, is it important? Oh, no. Do we have to pause? I'll look at it. It's fine. Okay. We're good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, no, I lost my... Jalen Maxwell, take it from there. Yeah. Um. So she's on trial right now. Of course, that's um Epstein's... Not, whatever she was. Yeah, whatever <laughs> she was to Epstein. Yeah. Um, so she's on trial right now. Um. With being charged with, I guess, aiding Epstein, who didn't kill himself, that Epstein. The, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> the one that, so, um, yeah, so that trial is going on right now, and there's been very little. I did see a couple of things on the mainstream news yesterday mm-hmm. about it. Um, so I guess the um, prosecution is resting their case, and the the defense is is starting theirs. But um. I didn't really to say much else than that. Like, yeah. That was really all you got from your mainstream media. Well, I imagine that this is super secret. It, it partly it makes sense because there are some, you know, witnesses and so forth that want to maintain anonymity. Yeah. Um, at least in public. Of course, in the U.S., you can face your accuser, so um, yeah. they they can't maintain. I mean, the. Defense knows who the witness is. That's, I guess, what yeah. I'm trying to get at. But the they've been trying not to release that information publicly. Yeah. Um, and I can understand why uh, some of these people would not want to be named publicly since this trial implicates some very powerful, influential people, well, potentially. I, oh, yeah. And that's that's really kind of where the rubber hits the road. Like, there's so many powerful people who mm-hmm. were in this circle, whether or not they're... I mean, I... I'm going to just assume they're all guilty, <laughs> yeah. but um, whether they are or not, they they were in the circle, you know? Yeah. So. Um, well, I, I hadn't heard much about that. If you want to, do you have more to? Not really. I mean, like I say, about? there's not other than my understanding is, is it doesn't look like the prosecution is making a very strong case. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just kind of what I've read and seen. I don't really have a whole lot of details on, on the case they're making or any of that, okay. but, um, just that it doesn't sound like they're doing a very good job. Um, well, the main thing that I remember hearing is that one of the defense's points um, was something along the lines of, uh, ever since the Garden of Eden, uh, women have been held accountable for the crimes of men, or the bad behavior of men, I think, actually, is how they said it, the bad behavior of men. So they're like making a case that, that she's a scapegoat for Jeffrey Epstein's bad behavior. But, yeah. um, you know, the other things that, I, that I've heard about this is that the witnesses at least are claiming that she was like present for some of the uh, alleged no, bad yeah. behavior. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. It yeah. doesn't... That seems like a... That seems so, like a weak tack to take. Well, I was going to say, it just seems like a cop-out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and that actually brings us into the other case, which is uh, Elizabeth Holmes. She was the um, CEO of the Theranos. Ah, yeah. That 
many, many years ago uh, claimed to have a blood test that could give you all kinds of results with just a few drops of blood. Yeah. Um, and uh, the case alleges that she defrauded investors by claiming that they could do more than they were actually capable of doing. Yeah. Um, and it and turns out that they were outsourcing some of the uh, some of the testing because their equipment couldn't actually get the results that they yeah. Claim well, to be able they to just, at one point just making up results more or less. Yeah, more or less. I yeah. mean, that's that's been alleged as well. Um, now in court, and they were doing their uh, their closing arguments today, I think, or maybe yesterday. Yeah. Um, Thursday or Friday, uh, the sixteenth or seventeenth of December. Anyway, yeah. very recently they were doing closing arguments, and um, they're supposed to have some kind of verdict next week. Yeah. But. Uh, you know, there are some strong points that they're making in this case as well, that, um, that she was always, uh, open about what was going on with the test and how it was done and their testing methods and so on. Yeah. The, uh, prosecution in this case is, is saying, um, which I actually think is a fair point in terms of defrauding somebody that she was taking advantage of the information that, that the investors didn't have. Yeah. Um, so while she was being honest with them about how they did things, uh, it, it was in a technical way that they couldn't understand how <laughs> Any poorly way. it was actually being done. Yeah. It, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So like, yeah. So like there, she's explaining it in basically gibberish to them and they're yeah. like, Oh, wow, that sounds yeah, great. That sounds very scientific. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, her claim, um, th- but her other claim in this is that, um, the COO, whose name escapes me now, um, it's a foreign name. I don't remember. Oh well. Anyway, um, who was her uh, her live-in boyfriend at the time that all this was going on? Um, and they had a relationship for something like a decade. Yeah. Um, that he was um, sexually abusing her. And, uh, or just abu- and probably just like, a, she was, a, he was being abusing abused. her. Yeah. Um, and that that's why that she didn't know what she was doing and she was being abused or coerced or something in some way from, by her boyfriend that she was living with, who was the COO of the same company wow. for a long period of time. I'm just saying she was being pretty convincing if she was trying, if she was, yeah. If well, all of that was under coercion, like she was, she was pretty yeah. persuasive in the stuff I saw. Well, I mean, as far as I can tell, this girl is very bright. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and she's very pretty. Yeah. And you know, you get a, a, a smart, attractive woman in a room with a bunch of investors, like talking in a way that sounds legitimate and so forth. I mean, I can yeah, see how it's easy to get there. Yeah. yeah. She's a salesperson. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, and, and it's, I'm not trying to make the claim that people don't stay in abusive relationships for long periods of time. Cause I know that that happens, yeah. but again, in this case, it seems like a cop out. Yeah. Yeah. I agree that. Um, and so, you know, it, it brings us to a point that I, I think, I think that is in, it's important to, Um, to say here. Now we believe in personal liberty. We believe in, you know, the sovereignty of the individual, if you will. Um, I hate to say it that way because it ends up being associated with whatever the, um, what's, what's the weird group of ultra, you know, sovereign individual thing. You Uh, know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. It's like this, like the the far right wing kind of, yeah. um, So I hate to say it that way, but yeah. But anyway, the point being that, you know, um, you own yourself yeah. like, and you're responsible for your actions. And I, I think that we end up in this weird situation where, um, and it's not just women in the society, but this comes up a lot with women who have found themselves in powerful or influential positions, um, where they're just as likely to, you know, commit Crimes. criminal acts. Yeah. As, uh, as men are, and the defense becomes, well, it was because of a man that I was doing this, that it was outside of my control. And I think that somewhere along the way, you, you have to decide as a group, I I think that this reflects poorly on women. Yeah. Um, and I think you kind of have to decide as a group that you either have agency or you don't. Yeah. All right. I think that you do. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And so, but it it doesn't it doesn't which is do the reason it's such a good. cop out when you yeah. when you make these kind of claims that mm-hmm. oh well if it hadn't have been for X man I wouldn't have done yeah. X Y and Z when in reality like that that had nothing to do with it yeah um, I mean I, I think women should be decrying these two women uh, the you know if you well, if you believe in equality of the sexes then it it has to work both ways. You can't yeah. claim that you didn't have control whenever things go badly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like I said, this, it's not just women, like lots of people do exactly that, that, you know, blame yeah. some kind of outside force when, um, when things go badly for you, either like in well, criminal cases like this, or even just like, you know, that you ended up down on your luck and things didn't work out for you and you ended up in a bad place. Um, we, but we your decisions in, lead to this. We live in a society that, that likes to blame others for their problems. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we do, I, I actually would point back to the, um, ah, oh, it's that, uh, that victimhood, uh, Ponzi scheme. Well, it, it is. Uh-huh. Um, but it's not just that, like in, just in everyday life, like people don't want to take responsibility for their actions. Mm-hmm. I think back to Alec Baldwin. Yeah. With this, oh. the, this is actually oh, a good example. That is an excellent example. Because like he, he won't even admit that he pulled the trigger on a gun yeah. that kills somebody, even though there's, there's, Hey man, it's the new magic bullet. It's the magic bullet, man. Like that's <laughs> his defense. Like yeah. that's like, he's out there openly saying that. And it's the most ridiculous thing ever. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, I just I, it blows my mind. Th- that one in particular blows my mind, but it mm. goes to the bigger point well, he, of his uh, everywhere. Actually, before yeah, before you even move on from Alec Baldwin, he actually explicitly said in that interview yeah. um, that he took no responsibility, that he didn't feel at all responsible for this. Yeah, which is absolutely insane. Yeah, like I mean, I don't know how you can you can be holding the gun that killed somebody. Yeah. And yeah. feel no responsibility whatsoever. No responsibility. That, that's well, that's a sociopathic. I'll tell you, he's a good actor <laughs> because yeah. because there's no way. Because I watched the at least the snippets from that interview mm-hmm. where he was where all of that was going on, and I was like, yeah, like dude, this guy is straight up acting. Yeah. Like this is this is him putting it on display for mm-hmm. us. Um, did you hear the part where he? Uh, he was saying, well, she was telling me where to point the gun and so forth. Like she, like yeah. it, it was, you know, you talk about victim blaming. Well, yeah. I shot this person because they were telling me to point the gun at them. And, uh, you know, yeah. I don't know. It was well, just like this yeah, really because weird thing. Was, Cause there's I no way I, I can't even imagine this girl doing that. No. And I do remember that because, um, he was saying that I would never point a gun to re- even in on set, never mm-hmm. directly point a gun at somebody. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Okay, I mean, maybe, maybe not, but yeah. You wanna... But then, how did you manage to shoot this person? Yeah, oh, well, she you, was telling me the to point. The fact the... is, is that you shot somebody. Yeah, <laughs> like, or you were holding a gun that shot somebody, which we all know you pulled the trigger on that gun. Like, yeah. let's not. Well, and I, so I, I read a um, uh, a criticism of what he was saying in that that suggested something that I hadn't thought of, but it's reasonable. It's like, is if is is he splitting hairs on whether he had the trigger depressed the whole time. Oh, like yeah. that he had the, he already had the trigger depre- depressed when he pulled the hammer back. Oh yeah. Um, because then when you release the hammer, it'll just it'll drop. Tr- it'll drop. Yeah. Back well, down. Um, so is he splitting hairs with the idea that he didn't pull the trigger? He already had the trigger pulled. That he just, <laughs> yeah, that he just activated the firing pin. And that's, yeah, I mean, but that's almost the only thing that makes sense. Anybody yeah. who understands how a gun functions knows that this is not possible, well, what he's claiming. I will tell you, um, there's got to be video of this, right? I mean, they I were would. on set filming. Yeah. Like, is there not, vi- I mean, could, couldn't that be pulled and watched and figured yeah. out? Like, it was low budget, so they may not have been, had the cameras on all the time. Well, maybe I, not. I, you know, I don't know. Um, and... Uh, and while we're on that, actually, I just want to point out a possibility because there's been a lot of people questioning, like, why in the world would he even give this interview? Yeah. Right. Like, this seems so stupid for him to get up there and give this interview. This is what I think. I think he's poisoning the well for any potential jury in the oh, future. 
Oh, he is. This uh, is absolutely a legal move. He's yeah. talked to his attorneys, and and they ha- they have came up with if this if something was to end up to go to trial here mm-hmm. for him to have den- to full deniability to deny. Well, no, no, no. That's not even what I mean. I mean yeah. that that it's so public now. Oh yeah. That yeah. that finding jurors that don't already have an opinion about this. Oh well, that's tr- that's true um, too. Good that luck with like that. Setting up for a mistrial, like there's no way that the jurors didn't already have an opinion formed when they went in because you know yeah. 60 million people saw this interview and oh that's true know. too I hadn't considered that like, I mean yeah I think he's poisoning the well for the jury in the future so that they can either claim a mistrial or make it impossible for it to come to trial I don't see them prosecuting him anyway well, I, I absolutely either. think they should mm-hmm. but I don't think it will happen yeah um, it, it just it won't you know yeah um, well uh well, all this was going on, we got uh, still the Ukraine stuff. Yeah. Um, the U.S. has backed off a little bit. Uh, they have actually made it a point to say that the told Ukraine that they that it'll be at least a decade before they can enter NATO, which is of course Russia's big thing is that Ukraine cannot enter NATO. Yeah. Um, uh, now initially, um, and even in the the clip that we're about to play, they talk about how um, the U.S. responded by saying that. Um, that it's up to NATO and the and the countries in NATO to determine who enters NATO. That Russia has no say in this. Yeah. Um, but I, I just want to break down this clip because I, I'm going to play it in full because I don't want people to think that we're taking we're things out of context. Up, yeah. um, but I'm going to play it in full and then we're going to go back through and divide it into its eight second lies. Yeah, I got a really silly question that just occurred to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So I understand kind of how NATO works. It's like a deterrent and blah, blah, blah for, for other countries to, you know. To, so what happened in um, in World War II don't happen again. Sort no. Um, NATO, or am I misunderstanding? Well, I, I, think, I think the UN is more for that. Okay. Um, it was the League of Nations first, but that failed, and then um, yeah, so the Yeah, then we UN. had the UN, yeah. Um, NATO was really explicitly to try to deter the Soviet Union um, from spreading. I got um, you. And, and which is why people like Trump had the right idea when they said things like, why do we even need NATO anymore? Well, that was kind of where I was going with this is like, uh, because we don't need NATO. <laughs> like it's obsolete as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, the worst part is they're even trying to expand it into the Pacific uh, region so that they can use it also to deter China yeah. in some way. Well, um, what I was going to say is, like, why don't we just let Russia into NATO? Like, what would be so bad about that? Like, nothing. that actually would solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, from the outside I, looking I in, so. because I don't, I'm not as educated on this stuff as you or other people, but it mm. seems like that would fix a lot of problems. Yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, I think that you go the extreme in either direction and you fix the problem. You either bring Russia into NATO with all the rest of them. Yeah. Or yeah. you get rid of NATO entirely. Yeah. Well, I would, um, I would prefer it, to see NATO just dissolved anyway. I think yeah. that would be the best answer. But, I think it's in its nature antagonistic. Exactly. Yeah. So, but another interesting way to fix that is just bring Russia in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they don't want to because the whole point is to... To isolate them. Well, the whole well, point yeah. is to isolate. I mean, the whole point now is to generate uh, revenue for the military industrial complex. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just to to keep purchasing weapons. Yeah, yeah. Um, generally from U.S. companies. There you go. Got to prop up that government. Yeah. Um, and, you know, while we're on this, actually, uh, something that I, I failed to mention when we were talking about this last time, that's really, I think I failed to mention it anyway, which is really important, um, is uh, now Putin was talking about this conflict as it arose and um, and talking to his people about why it's so important. Do you remember the um, the Oliver Stone interviews with uh, Vladimir Putin? Did you watch a, any of that? A little bit. I remember okay. that, yeah. They were great, by the way, um, but it, like, it was really interesting. But one of the things that they were talking about um, was, you know, all these threats towards Russia and, and uh, you know, ringing Russia with um, military weaponry and so forth. And, and uh, Oliver Stone was saying to him something along the lines of, well, like, you know how American politics works, though. Like, this is just... Um, this, these are just political moves. There's no real threat involved in, in any of this. It's just, it's just playing for political games. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and Putin responded, well, yeah, I understand American politics well enough to understand that. He said, but I I I have to react to it as if it's a real threat. Yeah. Because what if it is? I mean, yeah. I can't let you just place missiles all around my country and not do anything about it because I know it's a political game. Yeah. Because right. then I'm in a disadvantage because, anyway. Yeah. Because then all of a sudden I wake up one morning and somebody in office decides they want to use those weapons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I have to treat it like it's a real threat. Yeah. Um, and I have to respond accordingly. I mean, and it's the same case here because, you know, one of the things that the U.S. is talking about is selling, uh, you know, missile defenses. Yeah. Um, to Ukraine or installing missile defenses in Ukraine. Yeah. But the problem with these little missile defense systems is that they can be very easily converted to offensive weapons carrying nuclear-loaded Tomahawk missiles yeah. uh, that could then reach Moscow in five to seven minutes. Yeah. Like, that's a really low... That's a and, problem. And this is no good for any of us either because yeah. uh, giving um, giving any leader of Russia only five to seven minutes to determine whether a threat is real or not um, makes it that much more likely that they'll just assume that it is and launch their missiles as well. Yeah. Well, and, and just think if the shoe was on the other foot. I mean, what if... Well, the Ru- shoe once was. Well, I, that's where I was going. <laughs> like, I mean, just imagine if Russia decided they wanted to put um, put defense mechanisms in Cuba. Yeah. You know, I mean, how would we feel about that? Yeah. I mean, we know how we would feel about that because mm-hmm. we've seen this movie play out. Right. So uh, Also an Oliver Stone movie. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I think, so, anyway. Yeah. Um, so here's the whole clip, and then we'll break it down. All right. It was a rare two-hour face-to-face with an urgent agenda to talk Russia out of invading a U.S. ally. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was with President Biden for the call. He told President Putin directly that if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States and our European allies would respond with strong economic measures. This is what has the White House concerned. Close to 100,000 Russian troops now amassed at the Ukrainian border. Ukraine, a large former Soviet republic, wants to join the U.S. and most of Europe in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In a statement after today's meeting, the Kremlin argued it is NATO that is making dangerous attempts to expand into the Ukrainian territory. Putin is calling for legally fixed guarantees excluding the expansion of NATO in the eastern direction. President Biden said no. President Biden made that point crystal clear to President Putin today that uh, the issue of who joins NATO is an issue for NATO to decide. Testifying on Capitol Hill, Undersecretary of State Victoria Nuland warned the Ukrainians themselves may rise up if Russia attacks. I think the Russians will have a very big fight on their hands, uh, that there will be severe casualties for them. What was Putin's demeanor over the course of the two hours? Did he signal any willingness to back down? If I would say that his demeanor, like President Biden's demeanor, was direct and straightforward, and President Putin was deeply engaged, and, um, and I'm going to leave it at that in terms of trying to characterize where he is. All right. And let's just take this piece by piece because the number of lies or, or misleading information, I guess, yeah. um, in this is kind of, it's, it's, it's almost kind of, impressive. It's kind of yeah. overwhelming, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost impressive. Um, and just taking, taking advantage of the fact that Americans don't know anything about history or what's going on halfway around the world. Yeah. Um, so here's the, the first little bit. He told President Putin directly that if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States and our European allies would respond with strong economic measures. Further invades Ukraine. Yeah, <laughs> that gives the, the implication there being that they've already invaded. <laughs> yeah, which isn't true at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, the economic sanctions thing, just as an, another side note, um, the economic sanctions is... Uh, is the reason that China and Russia are working hard to set up an economic infrastructure outside of the SWIFT system that the U.S. controls and uses yeah. um, frequently to punish people that we don't agree with. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, But yeah, further invades is, yeah, implies that they have invaded at all, which they haven't. Yeah, all right. So. All right, so here's the next bit. This is the next eight seconds, by the way. <laughs> all right. <laughs> This is what has the White House concerned. Close to 100,000 Russian troops now amassed at the Ukrainian border. 
inside their own territory. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the piece of information that's being left out. Yeah. Yes. Um, they are in a province next to the Ukrainian border inside Russia. Yeah. And it's not like they're they're like on the border, like they're preparing to invade. They're in military bases where yeah. they're deployed. I mean, they I mean, have there the has I, been a buildup, but yeah, the idea I get is that from just listening to that clip is that well, they're like lined up on the edge, mm-hmm. like waiting to go in. Yeah, like waiting got, for the marching orders. <laughs> yeah, right. right? Yeah. Any day now, we're gonna cross this line, and you better be ready. Yep. So yeah, there's are there's two great big lies less than thirty seconds into the minute forty clip. Yeah. All right. Um, So here's the next one. Ukraine, a large former Soviet republic, wants to join the U.S. and most of Europe in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is somewhat true. Okay. (laughs) Um, In that uh, the government of the Ukraine um, that the U.S. installed in a coup in 2014... (laughs) <laughs> because <laughs> the uh, government they were replacing was more eastward looking, was more aligned with Russia. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, you know, going back to uh, F the EU and Russia too, our episode uh, about the history of Ukraine or our involvement in Ukraine, um, where Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Piat, who was the ambassador to Ukraine from the U S at the time, were talking openly on the phone about ha- who they were going to remove from office and who they were going to place in office. And then it happened to like two weeks later. <laughs> well, um, and they talked about how they were going to do it too. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and because they, because our about, current president was very involved in that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. He, yeah. he was going to midwife it. Joe yeah. Biden was going to midwife it. We'll get yeah. him to tie this thing up. I yeah. can't remember exactly. What that they was said, about but it was the like that. way they put it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, uh, which the, is the reason that Hunter Biden was involved in all of these oil companies over there, right? And, like all of this ties together here, yeah. like <laughs> corruption all the way through. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I skipped a little bit here, um, just because there's yeah, won't completely take apart the, the <laughs> clip, but yeah. um, here's a here's another 17 seconds uh, where uh, our good old friend and friend of Ukraine, um, but not the EU. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Victoria Newland is talking. Testifying on Capitol Hill, Under Secretary of State Victoria Newland warned the Ukrainians themselves may rise up if Russia attacks. I think the Russians will have a very big fight on their hands, uh, that there will be severe casualties for them. Okay, we're doing a lot of preparation for a thing that's not going to happen. Yeah, right. Um, Russia has shown no interest in attacking the Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, they have shown interest in defending um, their uh, ethnic brothers from the not great government that the U.S. installed in Ukraine. Yeah. I, again, um, and of course, what she's talking about doing is what she helped do. <laughs> <laughs> in 2014 right <laughs> <laughs> we will we will create a popular uprising yeah. in ukraine against the russian should they invade should they invade should they invade but they haven't shown any interest in invading yeah. and um you know again i point out in 2015 there was uh there were um there was like a plebiscite in the donetsk and lugansk regions of ukraine and they voted to join R- russian republic yeah um and putin said no thanks yeah. Well, I was going to say it's not that area is not very lucrative for Russia, is it? Well, or, I mean, or is it? I mean, I don't really I know. I don't think that it would be. The only part that Russia was really interested in was the Crimea. Um, and that may be, you know, to give the benefit of the doubt, that first comment about further invading, that may be what they're referring to is, is yeah. Russia's quote unquote invasion of Crimea. Yeah. Um, but there was already an agreement uh, with Ukraine. Again, Crimea was purchased by Russia with Catherine the Great um, in the uh, late 18th century. Um, It was only given to Ukraine by, um, what's his name, that followed uh, Stalin? I don't know. uh, Khrushchev. Okay. All right. It was given to Ukraine by Khrushchev so he could solidify the support of the, you know, regional governors, essentially, um, but it was all part of the Soviet Union at the at the time. They still all answered to the central Moscow government. Yeah. Um, he was just trying to to uh, to solidify support from you know these lesser the, bureaucrats. Right? Yeah. 
Um, and even, uh, you know, there was some agreement along the way that the, um, the Russia would always have access to their port at Sevastopol in the Crimea. Yeah. Um, so when, uh, the Ukraine rebelled, um, and Russia moved into the Crimea to take their, their naval base, um, there was no fight. Yeah. Like the Crimea is ethnic Russians. Yeah. Um, now I think it, I think it's because there was some ethnic cleansing that went on during the Soviet Union days that it's mostly Russians and Crimea, but yeah. still, yeah. um, it is currently, uh, mostly Russians and they didn't fight about, um, about Russia annexing the Crimea is really their territory to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, so like this whole thing is, I don't know. This whole thing is just absurd. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason to be um, antagonistic, and there's no reason for the U.S. to have any say about any of this at all. Yeah, I was gonna say this is like a half a world away from us. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, this is essentially like this is essentially us getting involved in a civil war. It's not quite, yeah. um, but it's not far off. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're you know we're trying to use a divide and conquer scr- strategy to surround Russia in the same way that we've tried to surround. Iran and you know you've seen those memes with Iran in the middle of all the U.S. military bases yeah. and like what yeah. what business do they have to put their country in the middle of all of our bases <laughs> yeah, like who yeah. do they think they are <laughs> um, and we're trying to do the same thing with China yeah. and uh, and in fact China right now their um, Anthony Blinken was in Indonesia um, recently and he gave a speech about uh, you know freeing the Indo Pacific yeah and um, but and it was. It was long and kind of dull, but um, there was this part that I pulled out of it because I found it interesting that this is what we would say about anybody else. Yeah. Um, he was talking about, uh, um, well, I'll just quote from it. Uh, he says, uh, you know, Beijing's aggressive actions, claiming open seas as their own, distorting open markets through subsidies to its state-run companies, denying the exports or revoking deals for countries whose policies it does not agree with, end quote. And then there was something else about fishing fishing rights or something. I don't know enough about fishing rights to comment on that, but, um, but you know, all of these things that he's saying is Beijing's aggressive actions, um, claiming open seas in their, as their own. He's talking about claiming open seas in the South China sea. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's named after them. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not yeah. like they're going and they're trying to claim territory around Hawaii or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Now we are or in the Gulf um, of Mexico out there. Like Yeah. Now yeah. we are essentially claiming territory in in open seas in the South China Sea. Yeah. Because the US has claimed the responsibility of being the security monopoly for all shipping in the area. Now, if you're the security monopoly, to me, that is a claim of ownership. Oh yeah. I mean, in in its purest form, I would think. Yeah. Like um, my property, so I'm I'm responsible for defending this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, first off, the the claim they're making is that China is trying to claim territory that the U.S. has already claimed, yeah. really close to China. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the distorting open markets through subsidies to its state-run companies. Now in the U.S. We don't really do state-run companies, although the state-run companies do get big subsidies. Uh, you know, like yeah. Um, when was the last post office bailout? Anyway, uh, yeah. but and and actually, like we could go into here. We're already running a little long, but um, you know, we could go into here that uh, the first the U.S. government absolutely distorts market through subsidies to businesses. Oh yeah. Um, just because you call it a private business doesn't make it any different. Yeah. <laughs> you're still distorting the market. Oh yeah. Um, and as you were saying to me before, like you're also distorting the market through various regulations yeah. and requirements. Well, I think the regulations are just as much a part as the subsidies are. Mm-hmm. I mean, all of these things are ways to control business. Yeah, and this, and you on know. the opposite side of that is taxation. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right? So you got subsidies to to. Prop up some, a business yeah. and you have taxation on the other side to try and limit businesses. Yeah. And and just so that people understand how um, how ridiculous some of this is, uh, the U.S. Um, has – they also control this through tariffs, yeah. right? So the U.S. has huge tariffs on uh, sugar because U.S. companies can't compete with sugar prices with um, – 
with imports. Yeah. And so there's huge tariffs on these imports to raise all the prices of imported sugar to be Is roughly that the reason equal my sugar is so expensive? Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like the U.S. doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't also involve itself yeah. um, in distorting the market through subsidies and taxations and tariffs and of various kinds and oh, through yeah. regulation as well. And, um, you know, I, I think that I'll, I'll save the argument that the U.S. has been a fascist economy for a very long time for some other podcast. We, <laughs> we, don't... We, we should break that down one time. One, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, um, one day in the future. <laughs> yeah. I, I do remember talking to my aunt a couple of years ago about that and, um, and you know, defining fascism for her. And then she said, well, that would make the U.S. a fascist state. I said, yep. Oh, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> it sure would. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and then of course this one is the one that really gets me that last one not the fishing one oh, that's yeah. actually the last one but yeah. um, the denying the exports or revoking deals for countries whose policies it does not agree with which brings us to Iran yeah <laughs> <laughs> where we disagree with the policies of Iran and actually of course we're doing this exact same thing with China yeah and with Russia yeah. Um, but, uh, Iran right now, we're in talks with Iran to try and re-enter the JCPOA. Um, now the way the U S media is reporting it is to, to try and, um, renew the JCPOA, yeah. but the JCPOA has been going on all the time. The Iran nuclear deal has, was yeah. never ended. The other countries that were involved are still there. Exactly. We're the ones who left the deal and the deal continued once we left. Yeah. So we left the deal and then imposed a bunch of sanctions on Iran, yeah. claiming that they were breaking the deal. Now, there's no evidence anywhere that they were breaking the deal. Yeah. None whatsoever. Yeah. And the European countries that were, they remained in the deal because there was no evidence that Iran was breaking the deal. Yeah. Um, now, the sticking point here is, and, and this, by the way, is one of the worst things that Trump did while in office, yeah. is leave the JCPOA. The yeah. JCPOA made the world a safer place because it took away a reason for war in the Middle East. Yep. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, but now... Uh, Iran, uh, so that with Biden wants to re-enter the deal cause it was Obama's deal. Right. Yeah. So, um, but he won't just like sign back on. Yeah. All right. So the U S wants to, uh, impose new requirements on Iran in order for the U S to re-enter the deal. <laughs> um, so they want to, you know, impose, uh, some requirements about the Iran's, uh, ballistic missile program and, and, you know, um, added checks for the nuclear program and so on. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, the U S is complaining about the fact that, uh, the, the draft of the deal that they made with the previous Iranian government, um, earlier, um, uh, this year, um, the current Iranian government has proposed some new ideas, yeah. some new, you know, some new draft, uh, policies for the, for the deal. And the U S is, is, upset about that while at the same time wanting to impose <laughs> new regulations on Iran yeah. to, in order to reenter the deal. And, um, it's just absurd. Yeah. Iran is, says that before they are willing to let the U S reenter the deal or renegotiate any portion of this, they want sanctions relief. Yeah. And the U S responds to that by saying Iran's not serious about this. Okay. So these renegotiations such as they are, um, started in November. They're going on in Vienna. They're indirect negotiations, which means essentially that the U.S. contingent is staying in one hotel and the Iranian contingent is staying in another hotel and they're having um, like EU ambassadors run back and forth uh, <laughs> between them with these ideas, which is a hard way to negotiate anything anyway. That's um, insanity. But at, at the same time that Iran's saying that they don't want to proceed without sanctions relief and the U.S. is saying that they want to impose new um, new requirements on Iran, but they're not willing to listen to any, any requirements that Iran has or any requests that Iran has about how the deal is going to go forward. Um, and claiming that, and the U S claiming that Iran isn't taking it seriously, the way the U S decided to try and make Iran take it seriously was to impose new sanctions at the beginning of this month while these negotiations were going on. That's insanity. So we're in the middle of negotiating and then all of a sudden we're just going to impose more sanctions. Yeah. When um, the main thing that they want is to take away the sanctions. Take, yeah, exactly. Like, and, 
And I'll say, I say it every time we talk about sanctions. As far as I'm concerned, sanctions are an act of war, man. Yeah. Like it's it's no different. Like mm-hmm. it's just it's a soft. I wouldn't even say softer. It's just a different type yeah. of war. It's it's a medieval siege. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like in in those terms, it it is a siege. Yeah. Um, you know, trap them in their city and try and starve them out. Starve them out. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which Absolutely. is exactly what it does. Oh, yeah. Um, Which is the reason that they want it to stop. <laughs> yeah. Now, also, at the same time, um, Israel has made some veiled threats about military action against Iran. And the U.S. has said that it's working with allies to uh, to seek alternatives if diplomacy should fail. Yeah. Um, and when asked directly about uh, Israel's discussion or mention or insinuation that they may attack Iran um, without provocation, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. said that um, said that they didn't have a problem with it. When this is a direct violation of international law. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, at this point, you know, we make the law. Right. Be us being, me, us being the U.S. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, I mean, I guess it doesn't really. I mean, if we say it doesn't, then it doesn't because nobody else is going to come to us and tell us otherwise. Yeah. The U.S. is liberal world order or whatever they want to call it now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, the, the whole thing is, is kind of interesting and because at the same time, um, Assange uh, and the U.S. appealed the Assange extradition. Yeah. Um, so... If, well, I don't know. We go back. This isn't exactly the beginning, but Assange, of course, is the founder of WikiLeaks. Um, He really got in trouble with the U.S. um, in 2010 uh, when, with Chelsea Manning, he released the Iran and Iraq war logs and uh, the um, diplomatic cables, Cablegate or whatever they call it. Um, So that started all this. And the U.S. was unhappy about them exposing U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, of course, Chelsea Manning served a bunch of time. Mm -hmm. Um, It was released earlier this year, I think. No, early early 2020. Yeah. um, When they decided that uh, um, jailing her for not once again testifying specifically against Julian Assange, um, they decided that it they weren't going to pursue that in that way that the testimony was unnecessary. And so there was no reason to keep her in jail to try and compel her to testify again. Yeah. That whole idea of that is ridiculous, by the way, (laughs) (laughs) Um, that we're not getting the testimony we want out of this witness. And so we're going to jail that person until they give us the testimony that we want. Yeah. Does that sound like a U.S. justice system? (laughs) Uh, Anyway. Yeah. Um, so then, but the the big one uh, was in 2000, I think, anyway. Yeah. Um, the big one, of course, you know, you had something in between. You had in 2016 the release of the DNC emails. Mm-hmm. Um, that certainly upset a bunch of people. Yeah. Uh, when all it really did was expose that the, the Democratic Party here um, was uh, rigging the primaries for Hillary Clinton. Yeah, screwing, uh, screwing Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, right. Yep. Um, but I think the thing that really probably ended any chance that Assange had of living a free and long and free life um, <laughs> was in 2017 when he released the Vault 7 information, which was the CIA's hacking stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's what really did it. Yeah. Now, uh, he went into hiding in the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK in 2012, and he lived there for seven years um, in the embassy, like unable to leave the embassy um, because, yeah. you know, he knew that he was afraid that he would be extradited to the U.S. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, in 2019, uh, he... Um, Ecuador decided that they didn't want to keep him anymore yeah. um, and kicked him out. And uh, well, actually, they didn't even kick him out. They invited the police in the UK to come in and get him. Yeah. Um, so he was arrested in 2019. Now, this was coincidentally, I'm sure, um, either right before or right after uh, the approval of a big IMF loan to Ecuador. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. So, and the U S mostly controls the IMF. It's, it's yeah. one of the ways that we wage economic warfare on the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I highly suggest people read, um, the economic hitman. 
Mm. Yeah. And read the original version, not the re-release, because they actually cut information out of the re-release. So the, yeah. the original one's the one you want to find. I'm sure you can find it on eBay used or something. Yeah. Um, and that'll give you a lot of insight into how the U.S. uses the um, economic infrastructure, the international economic infrastructure to uh, get its way into wage war against others. Anyway, so... Uh, I'm, I'm probably falling into way too much detail on this. I apologize. <laughs> um, but anyway, he was arrested in 2019 ostensibly for skipping bail um, about an extradition to Sweden for sexual assault charges. Yeah. Those charges were eventually dropped. Yeah. Um, but they kept him in jail and uh, while they were having the extradition hearing for the U.S. Now, in a surprising decision for me, um, the original court hearing for Assange's extradition to the U.S., they ruled against extraditing him. Yeah. Didn't expect that at all. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the judge at the time, and, and it everything seemed to be rigged against him going into that. Yeah. And the judge at the time refused to extradite Assange for fears of um, his mental health and the deplorable um, prison conditions in the U.S. Yeah. Oh, that's reasonable. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and, More than reasonable. Yeah, just think about that from a a, yeah. a UK judge. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Like they, they, there's yeah. still dungeons there. Anyway, um, but the US appealed. They kept him in prison this whole time, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Um, and uh, on the appeal, um, a, a higher court overruled the Baritzer decision and uh-huh. said that he can uh, he can be extradited. Now, yeah. this isn't over yet. Uh, Assange can appeal again and, and has, and so it'll go to a higher court in England again, as well. Yeah. But they'll keep him in prison still. Yeah. Where his health and has been deteriorating this whole time. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, But the interesting thing is that the reason that the, the higher court overruled the lower court's decision is because they got assurances from the U.S. that he wouldn't be... Um, held in uh, in conditions that violated some I- issues that they had. Yeah. Now, the U.S. has already reneged on these kinds of promises with the U.K. before. Yeah. All right. So first off. Yeah. Um, secondly, the assurances do kind of leave it open for the U.S. to do whatever it pleases. Oh yeah. In the end, yeah. like if necessary, kind of. Yeah. You know, language. Um, but. Uh, I, I don't know. It it just seems it just seems absurd to me. And what we're doing here, though, is that we're holding accountable the person once again who releases the information about the bad behavior of government. Yep. All right. Yep. And this is something that happens over and over and over again. The people that were responsible for the war crimes were never prosecuted. Just the the journalist who released that information to the American public. Yeah. Um. You know, you have the same thing going on with the drone stuff. In fact. The uh, the Pentagon came out with their final decision about that drone strike as we were leaving Afghanistan that killed the 10 people in the one family, seven kids. Yeah. Right. So we said at the time that it was unlikely that anybody would be held accountable for it. Well, now it's official. Yeah. The Pentagon said there was no wrongdoing. Um, nobody will be held accountable for it. Now, at the same time, uh, Daniel Hale is in prison right now for releasing information about how uh, badly... Um, the U S has messed up with drone attacks in the past. Yeah. Um, and so once again, the whistleblowers in jail, the person that killed people isn't, um, and the same kind of things going on here with, with Julian Assange and already has happened with Chelsea Manning yep. and, uh, happened with John Kiriaki with the CIA torture. Yeah. Um, all the, the people that were involved in the torture, they didn't get any, uh, there was no, no accountability no there, but for the them, person yeah. who told us all about it did prison time. Um, the Afghan and Iraq war logs that exposed war crimes of the U S the people that committed the war crimes aren't being held to account, but the person who exposed it to us is, um, the drone bombings of, uh, innocent civilians, the people that were responsible for that aren't being held to account, but the person who told us about it is exactly. This is not a just society. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's upside down world, man. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess that's the that's just the point that I want to make is that yeah. you know the government protects itself. Oh yeah, yep, at all cost. <laughs> yeah, it seems. Yeah. Um, and you know we're we're living in a state right now where um, you know this idea of checks and balances, 
It just doesn't, it doesn't, it exist, doesn't anymore. exist anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, the executive has accumulated a tremendous amount of power and you even have points right now um, where, and we'll see what happens with these uh, COVID mandates yeah. um, because they're being overturned by courts. They're saying that the, that he doesn't have the power to do this, that Biden doesn't have the power to, to mandate these um, vaccinations. Yeah. But uh, the courts also determined that that um, he couldn't use the CDC for the rent moratorium. Yeah. And he just said to ignore the courts. <laughs> yeah. So now talk about a constitutional crisis. Yeah. You would think. Or you would think like, mm-hmm. yeah. But um, they're, the problem is that they the only check they the only check on government is government and government's not willing to check itself. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't you can't count, and that's that's what makes it so. We've talked about it so many times, but mm-hmm. you know, there's if if you're fighting if you're going against the government, if the government's coming after you, there's nowhere else for you to go to appeal to. Yeah, like that, you're just stuck. Like yeah, yeah. which is what the Second Amendment's for. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, really, that's no, actually I, what the second no, amendment is. I, you're absolutely no. right. No, I'm 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 right there with you, buddy. Yeah. Um that's that was the that was the plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Um I don't know. Do you have anything else? Uh, nah. we're we're actually we're running a little long here, so um, I tried to shorten shorten up a little bit with the clips though, we're gonna be over an hour. Nah. Uh I think, or pretty close to it. Um well, so okay. Well go ahead. No, I was just going to say my back's killing me. So. Oh, all right. Fair enough. Um, well, well, then we will wrap up there. Yeah. Uh, sorry we're a day late. That was my fault. I wasn't feeling well yesterday. But luckily, we could get together today oh, and record we, instead. Yeah, we um, counted up. And um, we uh, plant, let's see, so you know, a week from today is Christmas Eve. So Christmas Eve, yeah. I doubt we're going to be recording, well, no, we won't be recording Christmas Eve. I'll say that. Yeah. But Thursday should be a go. 23rd? Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll record on Festivus. Do you have something the 23rd? <laughs> I'm trying to think. I can't remember if my if I have to pick up my brother and his family in the evening on the 22nd or the 23rd. I'm pretty sure it's the 22nd, though. I'll check when okay. we get off. Um, well, so, if not, we can hit Wednesday. Um, I yeah. mean, all, the, all of those days should be. I mean, it's going to be a busy week, but we should be able to okay. squeeze it in. Well, we, we plan to squeeze one more podcast in before Christmas for everybody. Yep. Um, so uh, in the meantime, follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, uh, like and share, tell your friends. Um, yeah, right now this thing is passing totally through word of mouth, so we really appreciate you telling people yeah, about it. Using the word um, of mouth. <laughs> oh, that said, we do have some uh, announcements for the new year. Um, we are uh, at this point planning to... Um, to institute the value for value model for this podcast. Yeah. Uh, so give you guys some options to contribute to the podcast in whatever way you see fit, um, whatever value you think you derive from it, yeah. um, which I hope is a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, that, you know, those contributions will just go back into the podcast um, in terms of uh, some marketing, uh, some equipment upgrades, and of course maintaining, um, you know, uh, the, uh, um, the, shares and stashes and yeah. domains and you know all, all the other all stuff. The stuff that goes into it yeah um so you know we uh we hope you all help with with that because yep. we think we got a good thing here. Yeah, absolutely and um if you're listening you probably do too yeah so uh anyway uh join us in about a week um when uh, we celebrate christmas a little bit early with another podcast and we finally get this right and in the meantime Try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later.